thank you everyone for being here and remotely. So I'd like to uh, just mention some the, about this special moment that we are having here. We are doing this in uh, honor of the Rare Disease Day, which is celebrated tomorrow, February 29th, in more than 100 countries. There are over 6,000 rare diseases affecting at least 300 million people, or 6% of the world population. About 70% of them are genetic diseases, mostly affecting children. Yet, hundreds of maybe thousands of rare diseases remain without a known molecular cause. Lack of such basic information is one of the major obstacles hindering progress in rare disease research. Investigating this question to advance in medicine is at the forefront of national and international research funding agencies. Then to talk about some of these efforts and the translational impact to affected families, we are pleased to welcome Jill Hawkins. Uh, Jill is the founder and president of the FAM177A1 Research Fund. She will provide her personal family's journey from undiagnosed children to a new foundation with robust scientific network. Her goal is to unite this community and support the development of future treatments. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you, PNRI, for having me and for celebrating Rare Disease Day. Um, science does matter. It matters in ways that significantly impacted our family, and I'm honored to be able to share our journey with you today. <clears throat> Disclosure, I'm not a scientist or a doctor. I'm a mom set on an unexpected course that's inspired me to learn and to advocate in ways that I never imagined. So let's start at the beginning. <clears throat> My husband, Doug, and I had our first child, Nash, 20 years ago. He was healthy and hit all his developmental milestones as expected. A year later, we welcomed our daughter, Charlotte. She was healthy at birth. She was floppy, but she fell behind developmentally. We consulted experts and started early intervention. As Charlotte continued to fall further and further behind, she had extensive medical workup. Brain scans showed delayed myelination, but were otherwise unremarkable. We suspected seizure activity, but it wasn't captured on EEG. All her labs were normal. She had extensive genetic testing for the time. This was about 2008, before the days of exome and genome sequencing. So her chromosome testing was normal, and we ruled out known disorders like Angelman's Prader-Willi. Fragile X. So no one had an explanation why our gorgeous little girl was struggling so much. We were alone. We longed for a diagnosis, an explanation that might lead to specific treatments or a community that would understand the terrible burdens of this disease. Uh, like the disrupted sleep, the challenging behaviors, the relentless need for care and the debilitating stress that it puts on families like ours. We were told, she's a well put together little girl. Yeah, it's probably genetic, not likely to happen again. So given what we understood about it and our desire to experience typical development as it's supposed to happen, and in part to give our son Nash a partner in caring for his sister later in life, we decided to round out our family and we welcomed our son Cooper in 2010. Cooper too was born healthy and just as cute as his older brother and sister, but he too fell behind developmentally. And my husband and I had a dreadful sense of big shopping and we knew pretty early on that Cooper must have whatever it is Charlie. Although there was no test to confirm it, our medical team agreed with us. So we were distraught. But through the grief and an intense amount of love, we charged on more therapies, doctor's appointments, and testing. Cooper checked all the same neurodevelopmental boxes as Charlotte and a few bonus evil ones like congenital cataracts and early seizure onset. So what was probably genetic was now definitely genetic. And this lit a fire in me. 
Genetic testing had evolved in the meantime, and we were fortunate to have access to top-notch care. We were followed by doctors Dobbins and Mirza at Seattle Children's Hospital, who enrolled us in one of their research studies. Our family had exome sequencing, but this was inconclusive. Uh, they said at the time that there was this thing called the genome sequencing, but it was cost prohibitive, uh, new, hard to interpret, and that they needed five more years in order to sequence our kids. And I said, well, I don't want to look hard at it. I heard about the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, a uh, new program through the National Institute of Health. I applied, and we were one of the first families accepted into the Stanford location. So the kids were poked and prodded and evaluated. And three agonizing years later, they I got a call that they had found likely pathogenic variants on a gene called FAMP 177A1. Go back up one slide here. Um, Charlotte and Cooper had compound heterozygous mutations on FAM 177A1, knocking out the function of the gene. And although strikingly understudied, as it was described to me, with only five publications ever even referencing the gene, there was one paper out of Saudi Arabia that described a family with four siblings with overlapping symptoms to Charlotte and Cooper and variants on this gene. So we had found the causal gene. And a little fun fact about that paper out of Saudi Arabia, it was authored by Dr. Fauzan al Korea, who just happens to be presenting on this seminar, Science Matters in June. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be talking about SAN 177A1, but I hope they mention it, please. Um, so for the non-scientists in the room, uh, it turns out that my husband, Doug, and I each have a complete working copy of SAN 177A1. And we have one copy with a variant. In our case, we each have a different deletion. We had a 50-50 chance of giving the working copy or the non-working copy to our children. And it turns out we gave both non-working copies to Charlotte Cooper. And now we know you only need one working copy for this gene to do its important work. So we had a one in four chance with each pregnancy to have an infected child. So after a 14 year diagnostic odyssey, we set sail from undiagnosed island. Mind you, we are in a ragtag ship with a really lean crew, but we were on our way. I also created a virtual lighthouse so that anyone interested in FAM 177A1 could find us, and it's working. Dr. Baruch Uger, a researcher at Yale in Dr. DiCamilli's lab, was working on lipid transport. She contacted me when she discovered that FAM 177A1 interacts with her protein of interest. She's now a vital part of our research network and a trusted advisor. Her paper describing the work on FAM and CPF13B is approved and awaiting publication. In addition, families from all over the world have found us, and now they know they are not alone. We are a small but growing supportive community. Earlier, I mentioned that Doug and I simply wanted a diagnosis. We'd assume that treatments were out of reach. But due to the astounding pace of scientific discovery, treatments and cures for similar monogenetic diseases are being developed. And so I got to work. I studied and contacted the authors of every paper ever published about FAM. I cajoled my way into scientific meetings, learning, and sharing the lived experience of this disease so that their research would align with parents, patients' needs. I talked to other rare disease warrior parents who are their head of this, in this journey than me and consulted with thought leaders in the rare disease world. I attended the Ultragenics Rare Disease Entrepreneurial Boot Camp to learn how to create a roadmap to a cure. I assembled a team of world-class experts to advise us as we strive to accelerate the science and move as quickly as possible from bench to bedside. And in 2001, I founded the FAM 177 AM Research Fund with the mission of improving the lives of everyone impacted by this disease. And now I'm gonna dig into the science because well, it matters. 
and because I think it's really cool. So what do we know about FAM177A1, Related neuro Neurodevelopment and Disorder? And this is a working name because this is still considered a novel disease because we don't have enough published on it. So I'm gonna go off script for a second and say one of the hard truths that I've learned in this journey is the agonizingly slow pace of academic publishing. As well-intended as researchers are, it's, it's painfully slow and frankly harmful to patients that are suffering. Um, so we are still considered a variant of uncertain significance and genetic pedals. Uh, so we're missing patients. A little bit more about that later. Um, so we know of about 20 patients worldwide. This is undercounted for reasons I just mentioned. All patients have biallelic predicted loss of function variants on FAM177A1. These variants include homozygous frame shift, nonsense, and axon level deletions. And shared phenotype macrocephaly, which is large head size, global developmental delay, intellectual disability, seizures, behavior abnormality, tone issues, and gait disturbance. The mechanism of this disease is unknown. And I have a couple of videos and these are shared with permission from the families. So you can see the unusual gait that all our fam, all our fam friends have. Oopsie, what happened? Sorry. As we've connected with other families, we share images of our children, shoes, who all have a similar wear pattern, that they just have this toe drag due to ataxia, and we burn through shoes at a rapid pace. And then the spinal picture is of our son's Cooper in the hospital last year. We uh, had to make nine trips to the hospital due to uncontrolled seizure. Um, so the science of FAM, I'm gonna call it FAM because FAM 1771, it rolls off my tongue, but it's quite the alphabet soup. It's a highly conserved, ubiquitously expressed gene that localizes to the Golgi complex. It's found in almost every cell of the body. Uh, it's a critical immune associated gene. It makes a protein that we now know is vital for health. It's a very small protein. Um, its function's undefined. And because it's small, it is amenable to an AAV therapy. Um, RNA sequencing data and metabolomic data on patient cells and in animal models and cellular models um, suggest dysregulation of pathways associated with apoptosis, inflammation, and cell proliferation. <clears throat> so there's a lot of work to be done, but we're moving fast. This is a solvable problem and we have a plan. Here you can see some of our research priorities. I suspect there are some brilliant scientists watching with expertise in these areas. I urge you to make a fantastic choice and study FAM177A1. Here are some of the projects that we're already working on that demonstrate that we're a highly motivated, research-ready patient group. We have patient cells and plasma banked and ready to ship to researchers. We have zebrafish at Washington University, flies at the University of Utah, and mice at Jackson Labs. We're collecting patient data, and we are awaiting the results of a proteomic study to identify disease-specific biomarkers. The average drug takes 10 to 15 years and millions, if not billions of dollars to develop. These are resources that rare disease groups just don't have. That's why rare disease groups like ours are looking for new uses for existing drugs and doing this with high throughput drug screens. I wanna tell you about our drug screen project with Dr. Clement Chow at the University of Utah. Dr. Chow has created uh, FAM deficient flies to model the disease. The FAM deficient flies are very unhealthy and 100% of the male flies die in the pupae before they can reach adulthood. This is called a phenotype. 
Then they take those flies and feed them 1,500 FDA-approved drugs, and they see which ones improve the health of the flies. You can see from this graph that um, most of the drugs had no effect, but many did. And we had 30, 33 drugs that rescued the male flies uh, more than 80%, and our top hit rescued 96% of the male flies. So these are safe, available drugs that might be effective on FAM disorder. So Dr. Chow and his team are validating those hits on some other phenotypes, including seizures. And then together with our medical team, we'll determine which drugs that we might uh, move into FAM patients. Okay, pop quiz for all the smarty pants out there. Um, one interesting finding from our study is that more than 60% of our top hits had a documented acetylcholine relationship, but we don't know why. One research said the biology is telling us something, but what? If you have ideas, reach out. So in summary, after, four, after a 14 year diagnostic odyssey, we're moving fast and in a short amount of time. We're connecting and supporting families. We're building a collaborative patient focused research network. We hosted the inaugural FAM 177A1 Family and Research Roundtable in June. Families shared stories and uh, 10 lecturers gave really interesting talks from genetics to gene therapy, um, soup to nuts, we covered it all. You can watch that on our website, curefam.org. The bad news is, as I mentioned, we are still of us, so we're missing patients. Hopefully, uh, with some more published literature, we'll move to the likely pathogenic category soon. Um, and the, there's an adage, too rare to care. Um, so like most rare diseases, we, we have a solvable problem and it's just a lack of resources. Um, and then the ugly, this is a devastating disease. And despite being warriors and really, really cute kids, our kids are suffering. They require intensive nonstop care and our families are to the brink. Our daughter, Charlotte, is the oldest living patient that we know of with FAM disorder. So we don't know the prognosis of this disease. She's on a course to lose her ability to walk. Our son Cooper has regressed because of his seizures. But what if we can discover disease-modifying treatments in a time frame to keep Charlotte walking and to free Cooper of the assault on his brain? What if we can develop a gene therapy and get it into future patients in a time frame that prevents this disease altogether? What if? In conclusion, on Rare Disease Day, I want you to know that science matters. It transforms lives. And by working on rare disease, you'll impact families like ours. And you just might unlock some of the mysteries of the larger medical juggernauts, like Alzheimer's and ASL, they LS. <laughs> And to the researchers, thank you. I encourage you to engage with patients. Spend time with a family impacted by rare disease. Our door is wide open. And because rare diseases are not so rare, odds are there's another rare family in your neighborhood. Take a selfie with a rare kiddo, bring it to work. And when you look up from your microscope, be reminded of why you're doing this. Science matters. The work you do matters and you can make a difference. So on behalf of these fantastic warriors, whoop, that just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Victoria Brown, I'm 
scientific officer at Seattle Children's. Mm. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for this beautiful talk. It was really inspiring. And, you know, I worked um, at Children's National Hospital for 23 years before joining Seattle Children's last September. And <clears throat> the work that we do depends so much on uh, families and families and families inter integration of the work with the researcher. So you thank us. I need to thank you. Uh, I'm a still active researcher. My lab is downtown here in Seattle. I'm a developmental neuroscientist and I work on neurodevelopmental disabilities and premature brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, so everything that you said resonated incredibly with me. And I really want to thank you. <clears throat> But you brought up to our attention a lot of important issues, including the issue of uh, publishing results uh, in a timely fashion, and which is not always under our control. Actually, most of the times it's not. Uh, because we rush into submitting articles, but then the review process. And so I think that, that we could work together, uh, researchers and families, to put pressure and to bring the attention of editors and editorial boards of how important it is for families who are suffering through these issues every day to publish our work in a timely fashion. And uh, so I think that what you said is really important and, and it, it resonates. I have a comment on, uh, on a thought on the asset encoding question that you asked. Uh, it made me think about my early career when I was studying the effect of neurotransmitters on brain development. So there's <clears throat> a lot of literature on how neurotransmitters are not only involved in signaling between neural cells, but also at some specific stages of development, they can be involved in shaping neural circuits development. So I haven't caught up with the literature on acetylcholine more recently, but I think there is a possibility that at least to a certain extent, as the calling may have a role in shaping uh, cell development in the brain and, and neural circuits uh, development. Um, so I think it's something to think about and uh, something that is an additional role for a neurotransmitter, like GABA and glutamate and other neurotransmitters have in the developing brain. Um, something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, we will be giving it more thought and I might connect with you to brainstorm Absolutely. ideas. I'll my card as soon as I read that. Great. And um, I love your enthusiasm and your knowledge of the field and knowing the value that, that patients and families can add to research. Um, and I love that you're here in Seattle. And I really think that this region can and should be uh, a world leader in this area. Um, we yeah, have the resources for it. We're going we are in that trajectory. And I, I hope that we'll be number one very soon. <laughs> but um, I, I think one important point that I want to make that you made that even when we identify mutations in a specific gene, we, we are not done. I mean, it's really the beginning because understanding, you know, we, 7,000 pediatric genetic diseases, only 5% of them have some therapeutic interventions for. But we don't understand, we need to understand the mechanism. So the work that you are doing, understanding the cellular mechanisms of these, these mutations is really important. So thank you. So I, I actually have one comment, which is that I don't think the publication timeline is the, usually the journals. It's actually the researchers, the clinicians who are involved who are waiting to publish because they want to collect more data. Sometimes it's to be sure, but a lot of times it's because they want to get into a higher profile journal. And so they're waiting until they have the mouse model or the you know, zebrafish model or whatever and put that together to get the paper out. Um, but when they could have published, like, for example, I, I'm aware of your story. I've been following you for a number of years. You are actually mentioned in a paper we have in, in review right now um, as an example of families who are not waiting for the publication to uh, look for treatments. And um, the, the, the number of families that are, exist right now could be published. This could be published within three months. I can guarantee. Um, 
one of the de uh, one of the uh, deputy editors for uh, HEG Advances, published by ASHG, and um, well, I can tell you that's that's sort of our publication timeline. It's that people are waiting and sitting on this data. So we've actually like we created a website, my name too, so that families can just put information up there online and say, here's our phenotype, here's our variants. We want this to be available to everybody else so that we don't have to wait for this long protracted publication process. Yes. Um, yeah, and I think that's something that as a field that we have to kind of recognize that we are holding this progress back because we're trying to since you gained yeah. and I, and now that I know more about it, I understand that that is their currency and it is important. Um, and had I known then what I know now, the importance of having a publication, I was told by um, Gene DX that uh, they can't, they need at least two publications. They need a lot, you know, there's a certain amount of evidence before it can move over. And they only had one, the one I referenced. And so what, what I would have done right away is worked with someone to capture the information that we have and somehow get it published, call it a case study, like just get something out there. But I didn't know that. So that would be something that I think that's a change that we can make is working with these newly diagnosed families, clinician to get something published um, sooner. Yeah, the, the problem is that sometimes even if you publish one patient only or two, it takes some time to go to databases that like only or guard or others. They are so mm -hmm. I guess we are still a little behind on that. Mm -hmm. that sense. And that is important, right? Because in the way that the, the doctors like, uh, oh, this, this disease is already recognized until then they are not. So. Right, right. Um, you know, and unless, I, you know, a, a family or a clinician might get the sequencing report back and gets the list of buses, and unless they really dig into those and say, you know, what if, what if it's this one, then the family goes undiagnosed. And unless they go back and, and revisit, you know, they could, they could be undiagnosed for a long time. Yeah. <clears throat> I had two. One, one was just a comment on this conversation with respect to kind of not only the publications, but for example, the ACMG guidelines that determine whether or not you can call something, I know you know this, but whether or not you can call something pathogenic, very mm -hmm. uncertain, significant, or benign, um, you know, also depend on the number of patients. So, for example, you know, our lab does functional studies, and so we have hundreds of variants that have zero activity in our assay, but, you know, until there are X number of patients who, individuals who come, you know, present with symptoms, that's, that's still going to be a bus. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one comment is, is also just the number of patients and, you know, kind of how ACMG needs to kind of, you know, wrestle with this, this stuff as well. Um, my other question was a science question. Um, so, you, so you have 30 compounds that look like they behave really well in flies. You also have a mouse model. Are you guys working with Jax to um, test these in mice? They are willing to do that. Our mice are still being characterized. So they're viable, um, but they're not breeding as fast as they were hoping. Um, they told me they're accelerating the breeding schedule, which is interesting. <laughs> um, and they're beginning characterization. Um, and as soon as they have a colony built out, they'll test whatever compounds we want. And um, we develop a gene therapy, they're gonna put it in the mouse too. They've been an amazing partner for us. And our zebrafish core, they're gonna test our, our top hits too. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you.